Hi, I'm Jerry Orajema from University of Massachusetts. And my topic in this lecture is quantitation of the left heart. I would like to acknowledge the contributions of my friend, Dr. Roberto Lang, not only to the ECHO certifying exam review course, uh, but also to the field in general. Uh, Dr. Lang, uh, when he was director of this course, uh, gave this lecture on chamber quantitation and was gracious enough to lend me a, a, some of uh, his slides uh, on this topic. Dr. Lang also made a major contribution uh, by head, heading up the task force uh, that published the chamber quantitation guidelines in 2005 and then again in 2015. I would call your attention to these guidelines and I think that it is worth reviewing this document as well as this document which came out approximately two years ago uh, authored by Dr. Carol Mitchell uh, which is a splendid uh, review of the techniques involved in performing a comprehensive two-dimensional transthoracic echo. If time is short in your preparation for the boards, I would recommend that you look at both documents, look at the images in particular and the tables uh, because uh, I would be surprised if you are not tested heavily on the uh, data uh, in both of these documents. So let's get into this. So uh, we're going to talk about linear dimensions and left ventricular volumes first. This slide summarizes the approach to left ventricular chamber quantitation using linear dimensions. Even though for the most part, uh, linear dimensions uh, have been supplanted by volumes at least in two-dimensional practice, it is still important to know how to make linear measurements. And for the foreseeable future, uh, this will be the way that we quantitate uh, the left ventricle, the aorta, and the left atrium in addition to volumetric data. So some things to keep in mind. We make our uh, diastolic dimensions at uh, end diastole, which is defined as the first video frame immediately after mitral valve closure. If you can't really tell where mitral valve closure is, as is seen on this slide, you can actually take uh, end diastole as the peak of the R wave on the electrocardiogram. We position an electric electronic caliper uh, at the interface of the compacted myocardium of the interventricular septum and we measure along a line that is perpendicular to the long axis of the left ventricle, uh, trying as best we can when possible to be below the mitral leaflet tips. The uh, septum and the posterior wall should be measured at the same time and level as the left ventricular diastolic dimension. Uh, and we are measuring the compacted myocardium, which is usually not that much of an issue at this portion in this portion of the left ventricle. But we do want to avoid right ventricular trabeculations, which can sometimes uh, bedevil our measurements. Um, now, the single dimension uh, in, in terms of giving us a heart size, the single dimension that I'm describing is only valid if the ventricle is shaped normally. We'll get into this in a second. Now, if you have biplane available, as uh, most labs do, uh, biplane can be extremely helpful in making sure that your linear dimensions are not obtained off axis. And the next slide will show you some of the issues uh, with making linear dimensions. So again, if you have biplane and you're using it on a regular basis, uh, you can make sure you can ascertain that your long axis dimension is indeed in the middle of the left ventricle. For example, this dimension here, 
is smaller than the maximum dimension obtained in the upper panels. And that is because the measurement is made off axis. So again, uh, I'm not recommending that you do this on a routine basis, but if there's ambiguity, or if you're particularly facile with biplane measurements, it can be helpful in reproducibility and getting accurate uh, chamber dimensions. The other issue is when you have a very thick interventricular septum and the rec recommendation, uh, if you have a sigmoid septum or disproportionate upper septal hypertrophy is to make your left ventricular diastolic dimension, chamber dimension and your wall thickness about a millimeter or two apical to the largest septal bulge. Now, the end systolic dimension of the left ventricle actually contains a lot of information. Uh, and it is important that we get this right. The end systolic, uh, the end diastolic dimension gives you a handle on the overall left ventricular volume. The end systolic dimension, uh, in addition to telling you about left ventricular volume, also tells you about left ventricular systolic function. Because at any given contractile state, the ventricle will squeeze down to the same end systolic dimension. And so for this reason, over the years, end systolic dimension has been a useful surrogate for systolic function. It reflects the severity of the volume load. It reflects the degree of left ventricular shortening. And when your left ventricular end systolic dimension is uh, is increased greater than normal, say 50 or 55 millimeters, those are large end systolic dimensions. This strongly suggests a depressed left ventricular ejection fraction. And for this reason, the end systolic dimension is still used uh, in the guidelines for timing of aortic valve replacement and mitral valve replacement uh, for chronic AR and MR. Let's talk about left ventricular volumes. Those of you like me who grew up on linear dimensions for quantitation uh, will be chagrined to find that the, uh, the Tischholz formula uh, or even the D cubed formula for quantitative, quantitating left ventricular volumes is not recommended uh, by the guidelines. Um, so I'm just going to spend a little bit of time talking about what these are. Um, in general, the left ventricular diastolic volume is related to the cube of the left ventricular end diastolic dimension. So if your left ventricular end diastolic dimension is five centimeters, your left ventricular end diastolic volume is roughly, volume is roughly 125 cc's. And this applies in normally shaped ventricles. Again, we're not recommending this use, uh, this technique for routine clinical use. But uh, those of you who like thinking about left ventricular geometry will find that a useful fact to know. Uh, the Tischholz uh, correct, the Tischholz formula, which was popularized in the late 70s, corrects for the fact that uh, as the uh, vent left ventricular dimension becomes larger and larger and larger, think about dilated cardiomyopathy, this D cubed method no longer applies and a correction factor has to be uh, introduced. Again, this is pretty much off the record, but if someone asks you in a normally shaped ventricle what the volume is, if the diastolic dimension is five, you can tell them 125 cc's. But uh, if the question comes up on the board examination, we are quantitating left ventricular volumes by two dimensional or three dimensional techniques and not the Tischholz method. So what are these techniques? The recommended technique is the familiar biplane disc summation. And uh, every left ventricular, uh, every quantitation package 
uh, pretty much in use in clinical echocardiography has the Simpsons biplane disc summation method uh, available to you. Uh, this method corrects for shape distortions, has fewer geometrical assumptions compared with the uh, verboten linear dimensions. A couple of the problems that we'll see are there is endocardial dropout on the lateral walls. And if the ventricle is abnormally shaped, you will not get an accurate left ventricular volume. And we'll be dealing with this uh, in a second. So the biplane disc summation method is preferred over the area length method. Uh, I'm not sure that anyone really uses the area length method uh, in routine clinical practice. Pretty much everyone uses the Simpsons. Um, and we'll talk about some of the pitfalls of Simpsons. But uh, it is important, uh, as we will see, that you do not trace along the endocardial cavity interface in making your Simpsons measurements. For uh, end diastolic volumes, I go about a third of the way in uh, on the wall. And I'm trying to get to a point between the trabeculated and the non-trabeculated or the compacted myocardium in the left ventricular wall. I err a little bit more toward the uh, compacted, uh, the trabeculated layer on the systolic dimensions. But pretty much, as you can see from this diagram, you're looking for the compacted, non-compacted interface in uh, drawing your endocardial uh, to blood pool edge. In the quantitation document, uh, we have the normal ranges for left ventricular diastolic and systolic dimension. And these do have uh, a gender and they do have an age dependence. So in general, male, normal left ventricular diastolic and systolic volumes are higher in men. They go up to 74 cubic centimeters or 74 milliliters in men and up to 61 in women. And these are numbers that I think are uh, important to keep in mind. The upper limit of normal left ventricular diastolic volume in men, 74, 61 in women. And uh, notice that as, as people age, left ventricular volumes do decrease. And this is in contrast to what was originally thought based on some radionuclide data from the 70s and 80s. Uh, and I think this does square with what we see in clinical practice. The left ventricular chamber dimensions are smaller in octogenarians and nonagenarians than they are in uh, much younger people. So again, uh, I can't overemphasize the fact that you are trying to draw your contour between the compacted and non-compacted myocardium with Simpsons. And this is illustrated here, and I'll just read this word for word out of the chamber documentation guidelines. Measurements for LV volume are made by tracing the LV cavity along the interface of the compacted and non-compacted myocardium of the chamber wall. These measurements are made in the apical four and two chamber view at end diastole and end systole defined as the largest and smallest visible areas in each view respectively. Now, very important, papillary muscles and trabeculations are excluded from the tracing. The papillary muscles become part of the cavity. And here is an example of an incorrect Simpsons tracing. As you can see, the person in question um, drew the Simpsons so that the papillary muscle was included as part of the wall. This will lead, this type of uh, uh, mistake will lead to a smaller left ventricular volume and should be avoided. Now, a number of studies have looked at left ventricular volumes by echocardiography, two-dimensional echocardiography versus cardiac magnetic resonance imaging here. And as you can see, 
these are two dimensional and even three dimensional uh, images and the gold standard here being cardiac MRI and zero if your values would be on the zero line, that would mean that your echocardiographic volumes are exactly what your MRI volumes. But notice, if we look at two-dimensional echo, two-dimensional echo with contrast, three-dimensional echo by various vendors, uh, and whether you use one beat, two beats, four beats, Pretty much all of your volumetric measurements by echocardiography, pretty much no matter what the technique, are going to be lower than your left ventricular volumes by cardiac MRI, with MRI being the gold standard. And why is this? Well, it's a very nice paper from Dr. Lang's laboratory a few years ago, breaking down the errors into tracing errors, errors uh, concerning the endocardial definition, foreshortening, which we'll spend a fair amount of time on, and geometric assumptions about the shape of the left ventricle. And these are illustrated here. It is, if your true apex might be here, but your image might be foreshortened, which we will talk about in upcoming slides, you will miss the true length of the left ventricle Sadly, this foreshortening happens a great deal in clinical practice. In addition, you may have segmental dilation that you miss if your imaging plane is your two-dimensional imaging plane is not ideal. With 3D echocardiography, you have a better ch chance by acquiring a three-dimensional data set of overcoming these errors, but three-dimensional echocardiography uh, is uh, is imperfect as well. It gets closer to the MRI reality, but uh, is not. It, it's not a perfect uh, measurement either. So, uh, Victor Moravi from University of Chicago has nicely demonstrated the sources of error using uh, imaging of some latex balloon phantoms. This is the impact that one has by tracing along the presumed endocardial interface here versus simulating the interface between the trabeculated and non-trabeculated myocardium. The true volume is 150 mLs. By making your tracing closer to the interface between uh, trabeculated and non-trabeculated myocardium, you come closer to the true volume of the left ventricle. And uh, Dr. Moravi concluded that tracing error is the most important factor contributing to left ventricular volume underestimation. Not inconceivable that you would get a question on what is the most important factor contributing to LV volume underestimation. What's wrong with this picture? Here are two-dimensional four-chamber and two-chamber views. And what I've given you is left ventricular volume on the four-chamber view, left ventricular volume on the two-chamber view, an ejection fraction, and left ventricular length. What I'm illustrating here is the effect of foreshortening of the left ventricle, which we will deal with. If you move your transducer down an interface, you will have a much larger four chamber left ventricular volume. And the four chamber volume will approximate what you got from the two chamber view. The ejection fraction will be roughly the same. What are the clues that you're dealing with a foreshortened imaging? Well, I listed them here. If the left ventricle has a globular as opposed to a bullet shape, if there is a discrepancy in left ventricular lengths, in general, the left ventricular diastolic length is a little bit greater on the two chamber view than it is on the four chamber view. But if there is a discrepancy such as what I showed you earlier, 7.2 versus eight centimeters, that's a clue that your four chamber view is foreshortened. And also if your apex is thickening, 
Now, of course, there are conditions uh, where the apex is thickening legitimately. Uh, endocardial fibroelastosis comes to mind, as well as apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But for the vast majority of echoes you read in your laboratory, if the apex is thickening, your four-chamber view is foreshortened. And again, foreshortening along with endocardial uh, difficulties in measuring the endocardial edge will contribute to underestimation of left ventricular volumes by two-dimensional echo. So foreshortening is a very common problem in clinical echocardiography, and let's just expand on this a bit. Um, it turns out that I used the term foreshortening for many years without completely understanding what I was talking about, and I did some uh, research on this uh, a while back in preparing for this lecture to better understand the genesis of the foreshortening. And the foreshortening uh, is nicely illustrated in this schematic. You are, your four chamber plane is not directed through the part of the ventricle with the longest left ventricular length. And this has been shown angiographically by Dr. Herbal many, many years ago, where he actually uh, did a sine ventricular gram uh, and tried to simulate uh, echocardiography at the same time and demonstrated that you were getting a more anterior cut of the left ventricle on typical uh, echocardiographic views. And here I've tried to simulate this by tilting uh, the diagram to show you what a foreshortened left ventricular four chamber view looks like in this patient who actually has an apical aneurysm. And you can see that uh, on the foreshortened view, you can actually miss an apical aneurysm compared to what would have happened if your four chamber plane was uh, adjusted to be about a rib space lower. So it does have clinical consequences. And I've tried to show this here uh, using this, uh, these beautiful CT images and how I wish we had this around when I was learning echocardiography. It would have helped me tremendously to understand the uh, echocardiographic image planes. So here I'm showing you the planes of the three chamber view, the two chamber view and the four chamber view. And this is an optimized four chamber plane here. Now, if we use our two chamber plane as the, uh, the plane showing us the proper imaging technique, what happens if we slide our transducer up and interspace? Keep your eyes on what happens with the four chamber. Notice how the left ventricular length is much shorter and the ventricle assumes a much more globular appearance. So this is the effect of left ventricular foreshortening. And I'll just very quickly uh, illustrate the same point using cardiac MRI. A foreshortened plane on the two chamber and you see a shorter left ventricle and a more globular appearance. We can do the same thing with three-dimensional echocardiography acquisition. So I think uh, we've made this point. Now, we've talked a little bit about the uh, virtues of, of two-dimensional echo. What about three-dimensional echo? The guidelines do not make a blanket recommendation that three-dimensional echocardiography should be used for chamber quantitation. And uh, I've highlighted the statement that in laboratories with the experience in 3D echo, 3D measurements, and reporting of LV volumes is recommended when feasible, depending on image quality. Uh, by having a more pyramidal as opposed to a linear image plane, you have a better chance of acquiring a 3D volume acquisition and eliminating for shortening. However, the frame rate and image quality on the derived images is not what it is for two-dimensional echo. So you may sacrifice a little bit of uh, accuracy in drawing the contours compared to more accuracy 
in knowing the true length of the left ventricle. The end diastolic volumes, not surprisingly, in view of the foregoing, are a little bit larger uh, for men and women using three-dimensional techniques. So advantages, avoiding image foreshortening, do not need geometric assumptions. In certain laboratories, more accurate and reproducible. However, the temporal resolution, uh, as we have noted, is a problem, and there are fewer data in normals. Contrast imaging can get us closer to the truth in terms of volumes. And I think we've all had the experience where we have a less than optimal two-dimensional echo image, can't really visualize the apex, give contrast and make the diagnosis of apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The use of contrast agents is recommended when more than two contiguous segments are poorly visualized in apical views. Now, uh, again, to reiterate the virtues of three-dimensional echocardiography, I believe are principally that you have a better chance of discerning the length, the true length of the left ventricle with the three-dimensional acquisition. And again, the Chicago group has shown us that compared that the two compared to two-dimensional echocardiography, the true four chamber length uh, in diastole is uh, about 20% greater when you employ three-dimensional techniques. Let's switch gears and talk about quantitation of the left atrium. And a lot of attention is being paid to quantitation of the left atrium lately. We understand more about left atrial physiology and understand that the left atrium really uh, has three, uh, left atrium, the cycle of the left atrial function has really three components. The reservoir phase where the mitral valve is closed and blood is coming into the left atrium through the pulmonary veins and the left atrium is expanding. The conduit phase where the mitral valve opens and blood coming in from the pulmonary veins goes straight through to the left ventricle. So the left atrium is acting as a conduit. And finally, in patients with sinus rhythm, the booster pump function of the left atrium. And in certain uh, ventricles, the booster pump function uh, assumes a much greater role. And we'll talk about that when we talk about uh, left ventricular uh, hemodynamics in an upcoming lecture. Uh, the reservoir function of the left atrium has gotten a lot of attention. And it turns out that the nature uh, of left atrial expansion during this reservoir phase can tell you a lot about diastolic function of the left atrium and, uh, and of the left ventricle. So, uh, left atrial linear dimensions are made uh, by looking for the long axis of the left atrium and uh, making a perpendicular measurement of the left atrium. Now, it's important to realize, and this is a slide that I borrowed from Dr. Lang, um, this kind of ghoulish slide that you see here shows that if you just rely on the AP dimension, of the left atrium, you may be missing out on left atrial expansion because the remodeling of the left atrium may be principally along the left atrial long axis. And for many years, we were actually in our own laboratory making these um, superior to inferior dimensions. And we would sometimes call left atrial enlargement if there was an enlargement along the superior to inferior axis. But we have a much better way of doing this now. Um, and this, excuse me, this slide also illustrates that as people age, they tend to have more superior to inferior uh, enlargement. So we have a better way of uh, incorporating both cross-sectional or AP and superior inferior dimensions. And that is the measurement of left atrial volumes. Again, two methods are reviewed in the chamber quantitation guidelines. The preferred method is the biplane method of disks. <laughs> 
uh, certainly preferred to single, chain, chain, single chamber measurements and uh, measurements using the biplane area length uh, methodology. And again, as with ventricular chamber dimensions, the Simpsons method or the biplane method of discs takes an area of the left atrium in the two chamber and in the four chamber view, you obtain a length, you specify a length from the mid portion of this line connecting the annulus to the superior portion of the atrium. And then the computer divides that length up into equally spaced mini volumes. And by knowing the width of each one of these disks or chips, you can arrive at the total left atrial volume. Now, a couple of caveats that I'd like to highlight. When you're doing left atrial volumes, the pulmonary veins should not be included in the tracing. The length of the left atrium should be measured in both the apical four and two chamber views, as I mentioned, from the center of the mitral annulus to the inner edge of the furthest extent of the traced a uh, superior LA wall at approximately the midpoint. The method of discs is the preferred method for calculating LA, LA volume as it avoids uh, fewer, it, as it involves fewer assumptions regarding the length, the shape of the left atrium. Uh, one can see the, uh, the partition values for left atrial size. Um, in the 2005 and in the 2015 guidelines. And according to these guidelines, anything north of 34 uh, cc's or milliliters uh, when divided by the BSA is considered abnormal. So going into the examination, I would have these numbers, this number memorized anything north of 34 cc's per meter squared is considered left atrial dilation. And this is true for both men and women. And as you'll see in Dr. Sengupta's um, diastolic talk, uh, left atrial enlargement is considered one of the key criteria for diagnosing uh, diastolic dysfunction. Now, I'm gonna go off the reservation here for a second and tell you that it is possible that that left atrial dimension partition value may be a little bit small. And in work uh, that was done in the so-called WAYS study, the World Alliance Societies of Echocardiography study, um, it is looking like uh, the left atrial dimension uh, may be in normals, uh, throughout the world may be a little bit larger uh, than the 34 cc's per meter squared. Uh, but you will not be tested on that. This is just for your own information. Uh, as I hinted, uh, left atrial dimension is an important part of diastolic function guidelines. Uh, you will have a terrific lecture on this, so I won't uh, get into this. I do want to point out um, that uh, something that, again, Dr. Lang and others using three-dimensional echocardiography have brought to our attention. And this is a, a little bit off the topic also. I doubt that you'll be tested for this. But what we are learning is that the, in, in many patients, the maximum long axis dimension of the left ventricle and the maximum long axis dimension of the left atrium may not be in the same plane. So in a view that is optimized to measure the left ventricular four chamber dimension, you may be foreshortening the left atrium and vice versa. Again, I doubt that you will be tested on this. Uh, this is relatively new data, but I think is, uh, is actually quite interesting. And this slide from Dr. Lang uh, illustrates this point. When you optimize, for your left ventricle, you may be shortchanging the left atrium. And when you optimize, clearly when you optimize for the left atrium, as is seen here, you are getting a globular foreshortened left, left ventricular dimension.
And in this particular example, the difference was about four ml per meter squared. And this would be enough maybe to get you into left atrial dilation territory uh, if, uh, if you were performing your left atrial dimension that way. And I will say in our laboratory, we do not do this on a regular basis. This is more for information value for you. Now, we'll talk a little bit about the, uh, or review a little bit about left atrial function, as we mentioned, reservoir, conduit, and booster. And um, let's just talk about uh, the reservoir function uh, here for a bit. Um, the expansion index of the left atrium uh, is what we're, was one way of measuring uh, the left atrial function. This is from a paper by Brian Hoyt from Cleveland. Again, a lot of attention more recently on the expansion of the left atrium during the conduit, excuse me, during the reservoir phase. And uh, I doubt that you will be tested on this, but just keep in mind that the function of the left atrium, how much it expands during ventricular systole is uh, looking like it is a, a good index of diastolic function of the left ventricle. Now with strain imaging, and you'll get a whole talk uh, by Steve Lester on deformation imaging, when a chamber expands, that is a positive strain. And as you can see here, these curves indicate systolic left atrial strain, which is taking place during the reservoir phase of uh, the left atrial cycle. And it turns out the more the left atrium expands during ventricular systole, the healthier the left atrium is. Uh, and this, uh, again, has been uh, illustrated in a, in a paper uh, from Chicago showing that if your left atrial reservoir strain uh, was within the normal range in patients with HEFPEF versus reduced left atrial reservoir strain, that seemed to have uh, a significant uh, survival free of hospitalization uh, in the patients that they followed up. So lots more to come on this topic. And uh, Dr. Thomas and all from uh, Australia have put together a nice paper in Jack on uh, left atrial physiology showing uh, their conjecture that abnormalities in left atrial strain, you see uh, smaller left atrial strains with worsening phase, phases of diastolic dysfunction, left uh, reduction in left atrial strain may precede uh, increases in left atrial volume, uh, may be more helpful than the E to A ratio and may precede uh, elevations in the resting E to E prime ratio. So it could be that left atrial strain might be a better marker of diastolic dysfunction uh, than uh, some of the uh, parameters that we have been using. Let's finish up in the last minute or two talking about the quantitation of the aorta. Uh, as you know, the uh, there is a virtual annulus that is formed by the lowest portions of all three cusps. And if you uh, join all three cusps in a virtual ring, uh, along the hinge points, you have the virtual uh, annulus. And of course, this is very important in uh, structural echocardiography, whether you measure the uh, aortic annulus by uh, three-dimensional echocardiography, two-dimensional echo, or CT, the sizing of the annulus is uh, of critical importance in uh, predicting which uh, size TAVR uh, you will be using. Uh, we know that the aortic annulus is elliptical, and so that your AP uh, and cross-sectional dimensions uh, are likely going to be different. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, um, we have annular measurements. We have measurements made at the so-called aortic root or the sinuses of Valsalva, the sinotubular junction, and the ascending aorta. And this slide summarizes using the aortic annulus uh, as uh, a landmark uh, 
you want to make leading edge to leading edge measurements. You want to measure these uh, dimensions at n diastole. And the ventricular side and the annular side is measure inner edge to inner edge in mid systole. As people get older and get bigger, their aortas get bigger. Uh, and there are a number of nomograms. This is from the uh, quantitation guidelines. There are a number of nomograms uh, that uh, relate body size, presence of hypertension, uh, and age to size of the aorta. In our own laboratory, we uh, utilize these uh, in deciding whether or not the chamber dimensions uh, constitute dilation. And just to emphasize on the aortic side of the aortic valve, we are using leading edge to leading edge measurements. I talked a little bit about the phenomenon of the leading edge in uh, my M mode uh, and spectral Doppler talk, whereas on the annular side, we're making inner edge measurements. You might be given a still frame and asked to identify structures in the aorta. And this diagram just reviews what one sees if you are lucky enough to get all three of the great vessels in the same imaging plane, which is not always the case. So I think I'll leave it there and I'll thank you for your attention.